The markets are absolutely ripping green dildos everywhere. CPI came in at 6%, leading some to believe that the Fed has the ammunition they need to pivot. But do they? And that's the question we're going to be asking today. Was Signature Bank unfairly targeted by the FDIC being closed because it's a crypto-friendly bank? Let's talk about it. Let's get into the show. By the way, do me a favor, like and subscribe to the channel because Clay told me he was going to scream at me after the show if I didn't tell you guys that. Mikey, take us in. Can you say dildos on YouTube? Is that is that something you can actually say? <laughs> Dude, all right. So, all right. For any of my 90s kids watching, I need, Corval, I need you to do me a favor right now. All right. I need you to take your glasses off just for a second. All right. I need you to pull that beanie down, like, like a little bit. I need you to squint your eyes. You say, come take a ride in my love machine, baby. Come take a ride on my love machine, baby. <laughs> that was close, man. I don't know. I was I was huge on Cheech and Chong as a kid, which lends itself to what the rest of my life shaped up to be. So anyhow, Clay, Corval, what's up, boys? What's up? Not much, man. So much to talk about. There's uh it's uh it's it's a good day. It's a I'm good just day. counting Great my day. racks, bro. I'm just counting my it's... racks up since the money's up. Corval, <laughs> Corval, where are you now uh, on your Oregon Trail? So, adventure? I mean, I'm off the like Oregon Trail. I got lost somewhere. I don't think it like goes Utah. through Utah or wherever Utah? these rocks are. But Maybe. All right. Well, let's get into it. Let's talk about some charts real quick. And we've got, we've got a lot, a lot, a lot to talk about. I don't know about you guys. I went to bed angry last night. <laughs> and we'll get into this. But I went to bed angry. Alan from Let Railgun had to, like, talk me off a ledge when I was reading the articles about the way that they played Signature Bank, and I really wanna dive into this today. But before we do that, so this morning, the CPI reading came in at 6%, exactly meeting expectations, and BTC has been on a tear, and it cut like butter through a very, very, very important level this morning, which is uh, right here, which is the 200-week moving average. And you can see the last time we cut through that was back in July, uh, I do not remember what event happened in August. I remember this is FTX. We had uh, Do Kwan up here. I don't remember. But we are currently above the 200-week moving average. Now, now, to be clear, that doesn't mean a damn thing until that candle closes at the end of the week. But So let's keep an eye on that. Uh, as far as Dixie is concerned, Dixie is starting to trend down, which is great. The SPX uh, is up 2% today. You know, I, I think Bitcoin is having its hold my beer moment uh, if I were to if I were to put put a spin on it, because, look, banks are crashing. We're losing confidence in fiat money. They're trying to actively squeeze crypto out of the traditional banking system. And and Bitcoin said bend over because we're about to we're about to really go on a run here. What, what's y'all's take on the market right now? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple of things that we need to be paying attention to. So, so Bitcoin's ripping, right? And so we're seeing Bitcoin dominance. Let me, uh, yeah, I got it right here. You got it. Interesting. And plus yep. it's a little bit, but you know, up to 45%, like that, you know, we're going to continue to see this rise. If you think about the way we see all these, these capital rotations before we see altcoins really go ballistic, uh, Bitcoin dominance has, you know, a massive roar, you know, rip up to a certain uh, I, I haven't dug into like where it would probably probably 48% yeah, somewhere around there and then start to come back down. And that's when you see money start to pour into alts uh, and you, and you've got the catalyst for um, really, really nice rips in the alt market. And I know I don't have the bubbles pulled up, but I, I think everything's green, got today with with the bubbles. green bubbles with the exception of, of uh, let's see, makers down a little bit. What is that? Oh, yeah. Gemini dollar. I don't know why that's even moving. And I thought Huobi was down. A moment ago when i was looking uh let's see there it is it's down on the week it's down on the week but either, you know. either way like you know the things that the things that we want to start to pay attention to long term are are the dixie right like if 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 the fed decides to pivot and risk on assets become uh, a place that people want to be and they start to get out of treasuries and so like when the when the dollar is less appealing and things like you know safe yield like treasuries become less appealing we're going to see the dixie start to lose 
uh, its dominance. And that is uh, a really, really key indicator we're going to need to keep an eye on moving forward. Um, inverse relationship between dollar dominance and Bitcoin going up. And that has historically always been the case. And every time we've seen a Bitcoin bull run, uh, we've seen a you know a really, really strong drop in the Dixie. Uh, I think we're still at 103 or 104, which is which is not where we want to be uh, if we expect Bitcoin to start to rip. And so um, that's I think you know something to pay attention to moving forward. Uh, Austin, I don't know if you'd add anything to that, but well, I want to add. So we're seeing something kind of interesting today, anyhow, in that we're getting. So we've got you see this ugly looking candle here on the two year. I don't know if, uh, am I sharing my screen? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. So there's a massive shadow on, on the bottom side of this right now. The two year is up 10% today, uh, which is a big move. I would expect it to probably, if, if any of these moving averages are going to hold, I would expect it to probably retrace somewhere in, in this area here. But uh, so when the bond markets are going up, that's generally bad for your risk on assets. Now, why is it that Bitcoin is moving way out of proportion to traditional markets and is it possible that the s p could see a retracement let me pull up some some dookie dukes here uh is it possible that the s p could see a retracement which i think i don't know uh but bitcoin continue to rip and i think the answer is we have a real probability of making that happen uh, i think i think we're in an environment where Regulatory, not regulatory uncertainty, but banking uncertainty is probably the best friend of yeah. Bitcoin. And if we close above 25.5, well, let me just kick over to uh, a tweet from Big Cheds here. Bear thesis dead if price flips 25.5. And to be perfectly frank, you guys remember I mentioned Bitcoin live here on the show a couple of days back. This is one of the one of the analysts. He's he was one of the founding analysts. He's been doing it for five years. He's one of the absolute best traders that I follow. And and you know, Bear Thesis dead. Although if you ask Capo, he's still short and strong. And there yep. ain't no way man didn't get liquidated. Does he not? He's probably not trading with stops. He's just letting it go. He's gonna blow up the whole account. I mean, uh, you know, the, basically the things we've seen starting last Thursday into now are are the reasons we're seeing Bitcoin do what it did like if you think about this show last wednesday we were on a very like we were talking about could could bitcoin see you know 18 and a half as a bottom before finding support and rebounding right and then trying to retest 25 and what have we seen since then uh we've seen bank you know the bank start to collapse so bitcoin as a store of value now becomes the same narrative as gold as a store of value and people are starting to realize that that's huge um Stable coins, unless they're truly decentralized, which any stable coin tied to a traditional bank account, I'm not really sure that you can trust it. Because if someone can mm -hmm. step in and close that bank and it's got the collateral backing of that stable coin, it's really hard to trust that. So the, the Bitcoin narrative gets stronger and stronger, particularly as the banks are collapsing. Uh, and we're 391 days away from the next Bitcoin halving. It seems like a long time. Uh, but if you zoom out, um, you know we start to get some momentum now it's only going to get stronger as we get closer to that date. So a lot, a lot of narratives as to why Bitcoin's picking up, uh, majority of which are about the banks collapsing and then what happened with with um, with USDC, which, by the way, is a massively unfortunate event. Uh, and thank God we repegged. But that is why we're seeing things, you know, like money just absolutely flood into Bitcoin at this point, in my opinion. So there's a big there's a big narrative out there, and it has a lot to do with what the Fed is going to do with the nef next FOMC meeting on the 22nd of March. And right now, the market is pricing in 20 percent of no rate hikes. Right. So we're currently at the 450, 80 uh, percent of them are pricing in a 25 basis point rate hike. And I'm interested to know, Corval, Clay. Where are you guys on the Fed pivot scale? Let's let's discuss that for a minute because there's a lot of information in that. Uh, I'm not super confident that they're going to pivot. I think if best case scenario, they just don't raise rates, but they just keep them there. Um, I don't think a reversal is coming. Well, a pause a, a pause would be considered a pivot. You think so? A pause, I mean, I think yeah, a pause I, I think is a just, pivot. I think they still not it's not acceleration, but it's not a reversal. I consider a reversal a pivot. I think a pause 
possibly to just let the the cards fall where they may. I don't know if that's the right expression, but yeah, just let letting things like settle down a little bit, let the dust settle to see kind of like how much damage they've been doing because they've been on a fucking tear, boy. They raised yeah. those rates so fast. If you look at the chart, it's like a straight wall compared to previous rate hikes. Um, so Austin, what what bank came out and said that they thought they would and, and not 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 raise but just pause like like to to do nothing yeah so let's kick over to it so yeah. here's a tweet from seth goldman and this is his name seth golden but this is from goldman sachs it says in light of the stress in the banking system we no longer expect the fomc to deliver a rate hike at its next meeting on march 22nd versus our previous expectation of a 25 basis point rate hike and even though the numbers are showing about 25 percent of your you know the people whoever whoever is going into making up that particular number um it's nice to see your bigger banks coming out and actually putting some stock on a potential pivot and i think what we need to discuss real quick is so when you look at at cpi just on its face we had expectations of six percent and we got six percent and if if you just look at it from that perspective well then you think everything is hunky dory. But the truth is, right, Clay, that's not the perspective that that Jay Powell is looking at it from. Uh, he's, you know, and this is a great tweet here from Andreas Nenna Larson, relatively hot US CPI came in today, which you wouldn't think by hearing it. But so rent of shelter continues. So that hasn't yeah. changed. Transportation services increased 1.14. And he's got this great chart uh, that actually show in which direction cpi is going and you can see for most of these with the light blue we're still going up uh yep. in a lot of these sectors and so i do know that recently i think on march 8th they came out and they again reformulated the way in which they're they're coming up with cpi and and with this particular reformulation it had to do with new car sales now new car sales only make up i think like six or seven percent of the cpi so it's not huge uh, but it did come into play and, and remember like, okay, so with, we've got the banks breaking and, and I think what we have to ask ourselves is, so we have a certain amount of information, which I would admit is very little, you yeah, know, I'm being good. retail. Powell has a shitload of information yep. and he has a shitload of information about what the banks are doing. He knows how deep the, the cracks go into the system and so he's getting information that probably we're not getting. And so my gut tells me that if he knows things we don't about the banking system and he knows really how fragile it is, um, that may be, you know, the catalyst needed for a pivot. I think if we had very low CPI today, it would have been a done deal. I think we'd see 80% predicting yep. no rate hikes at the next meeting. Yeah, I mean, so there's there's one thing that stands out to me and and when it comes to what's going to happen next and and obviously I certainly don't have all the information but but basically the government they they measure housing costs based on rent levels like rather than than pre previous home prices like the, the rent levels make up a, a huge part of the uh, the consumer price index. It's basically called core CPI x shelter and it's it's apparently one of Powell's favorite metrics as to like how he sort of determines you know the stuff that he determines coming next right and so i pulled that up today to figure out what's actually going on and unfortunately compared to december's data we actually saw an increase it wasn't massive we saw an increase in in uh core price cpi excluding shelter and so if that is something like you know that that Powell takes very seriously in considering continuing these rate hikes then that's not a, that's not a great thing. If you zoom out um, from a year over year annualized perspective, the blue line, um, you know, we've seen a massive decline from where we were, obviously in Jan 22 to Jan 23. So like things are certainly getting better, but on a micro perspective, as we were saying, uh, we did see an increase even in the CPI number. So if that is truly part of his like major, you know, term, determining factors for this, then uh, I would say that you know there's still i mean dude of course there's still work to be done but if that you know but if that's part of you know something he's really taken into consideration then you know we we did see an increase there so uh i don't i don't love it but you know i guess we'll we'll see what happens it's interesting that big banks are coming out and saying that they don't think that's there's going to be a, a rate hike coming up um this time but I, maybe I like the that. banks just don't want a rate hike so that's why they're saying it well uh, they most certainly don't uh so, i don't 
I don't think it's doing them any favors to. So I have a question I want to pose to you both, but Austin mainly. You said that the Powell has more information, so he probably sees more about how deep these cracks go. Uh, that would mean he he kind of knew this coming into the situation, right? He probably wanted something like this to kind of happen, right? Well, like, so that as I was saying it, I kind of caught the other end of that, which is why didn't he see this and stop it? And so whether that's true or not, I don't know. But my guess is, you know, if if your house is on fire in, in one room, you're going to keep your eyes on that room to make sure the fire doesn't spread. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, what I, I would imagine as chair of the Federal Reserve, he's got a shit ton more data getting distilled down for him and the other the other Fed presidents to, to look. Yeah, through. I, I was just going to say I saw a tweet. This is an expression I've heard before, and uh, it's something to keep in mind, I guess, is that the Fed likes to raise rates till something breaks um, for that specific mm -hmm. reason. I mean, they're out, they were out there calling for demanding unemployment rise, so it's not unsurprising that they want some blood in the streets. That's right. And there's another tweet, if you don't mind me kicking back yeah, over ahead. to this, Clay, yeah. real quick. So I want to share this with you. So this is a guy, his name's Joseph Wang. He's chief information officer at a place called Monetary Macro. He says that the Fed and central banks have been aware that segments of the market may break while tightening, but they're prepared to support these segments while maintaining tightening as the Bank of England saved the gilt market through purchases and kept tightening so the Fed can save banks and keep tightening. Now, here's the good news. The good news is I firmly believe that 25 basis points would not be a surprise in any way, shape or form. Consensus is we're getting you know, a quarter point rate hike. No rate hike would be a surprise. No rate hike would be sending the market screaming. And so if I were to make a guess, if I were to proffer a guess, I would I would guess that we get another quarter point rate hike, 25 basis point rate hike in this meeting. And then we get a pause at the next meeting for, for really one reason. The difference between, and this is just my own opinion, but the difference between, you know, the quarter point rate hike at this point versus pausing at this point is probably not going to make or break anything, but it will keep the fed at least on its face doing what it said it was going to do, uh, yeah. which is it already committed to 25 basis points. So who the hell knows if I that's mean, where we go. So the CPI numbers obviously came out today. They, they met expectation like that. That doesn't blow you away. That was, that was, you know, it's a positive that they didn't exceed expectation, but even so before those numbers came out, to just basically to back up what you're saying, uh, the market now see the base case as two more 25 base point heights with a 69% chance. And this was before the CPI numbers came out. Uh, you can see it here. So leading into 5.3, it would basically take us up to between 500 and 525 um, as the Fed's fund rate with, with two more 0.25s. And so that was before the numbers came out. I, I don't know if the numbers were, to your point, good enough to justify changing what we're seeing you know as the estimates prior so the, the the two things that you know i think that you have to keep like look all, all things lead back to the bond market and it's like what what is what are the, you know what is the 10 year doing after today's data came out and it looks like it's it's up you know ever so slightly uh and the two year is i mean they're both you know they both kind of sort of barely moved but as long as the two year is ahead of the 10 year then we've got an inverted yield curve and so two-year bonds are still more attractive than long-term duration bonds. And that is not a good thing for the market. Every time that's ever happened, we've gone into some type of recession. And this, by the way, this happened like, it's been more, more than nine months since they became inverted. And so mm -hmm. it, it, we, what we'd like to see is a reversal in those. And so obviously uh, today's CPI data was not enough to flip the bond market on its head uh, and say that you know the two-year is going to drop uh, so drastically that we're going to see a, a shift in, in sort of um you know what's appealing to investors in the bond market so the bond market is literally the leading indicator i think for everything that happens next and so definitely something that we want to keep an eye on uh as we move forward so uh, yeah so i think i think the base the base case is probably uh, a 25 base point hike next and if they don't then to your point like dude it's probably full send from there like if they come out and i think nothing, we're i think we're actually getting a decoupling though uh yeah. and i know you know since i got into crypto almost six years ago People have been talking about this stupid decoupling, right? It never happened. We only got more and more correlated. But, but 
when people purchase for emotional reasons, right? You have 40,000 tech bros that thought all of their money was gone for an entire 48 hours until they came out and said, we're going to backstop you. I don't think people like give a lot of credit to how powerful that is. And even if it wasn't your experience, from my experience looking in, I felt that pain, right? This is like, I've worked so hard. It's not just my money. It's my company's going to go away. All of these various things. I need a hard asset to put my money in to ensure that things like this outside of my control can't come in and take it. And I think, I think that's part of the reason we're seeing this brand new narrative around Bitcoin and by default around the rest of the crypto markets in that, you know, the banks can't be trusted and, and time is cyclical. I mean, we're just making our way right back to 2009 again, you know, with the Genesis block and the chancellor on brink of second bailout. So we'll find out what happens on the 22nd. Uh, but I will say this very, very positive in the markets right now. Like this, this 25, two to 25, five level has been a level we've been watching for a long time. If we close above it on the daily, very, very positive. We need to see a weekly close. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But I think the bigger story, uh, and, and I think you guys will agree with me is the absolute attack that the Biden administration specifically is executing on the crypto markets. Make no mistake about where this is coming from. It's coming from the administration. It's not coming from, from uh, the judicial branch. It's not coming from the legislative branch. It's coming from the administration. And that's the reason why they're having to enforce in these very, very strange ways. And I want to kick over to a tweet real quick. And this got me pissed off. Like I, I was having the conversation with my wife last night. What's going one, to happen? One, if one, they... second. one second. Go ahead. So go before ahead. we before we get so like I think we need, we need to back up like two steps before we go. Oh hell yeah! Before we go fully into signature, I want to back up two steps, and and just look. Let's reset the stage a little bit and talk okay. about Silicon Valley Bank before we talk about signature because I think that. The two are, are interconnected in terms of, you know, potentially breaking. The data is very different. The reasoning is very different. The backstop situation is, is sort of the same, but there, there's, we, we need to start there. So let's start there, uh, if you don't mind. Um, no, go ahead. So, go ahead. so basically, like, you know, let's, let's reset the stage as to what happened, right? So we've got banks that effectively have been holding uh, or able to use, um, you know, more funds to go out and buy long-term treasury, 10-year treasury yields. Uh, as the, as the fed started to hike rates super fast, uh, these treasury yields obviously became worth less and less a bank run happens. They have to liquidate those things at, you know, a 40, 50, 60% haircut. And then they've got massive holes in their balance sheet. So when someone, you know, when depositors come and ask for the money back, the money's not there. Right. So that's, that's basically what we've seen. So, you know, we have not seen, uh, unrealized gains, you know, basically effectively losses on investments, uh, investment securities like this really ever, like. Look at the 2008 great fin or, uh, global financial crisis. Like it was nothing in comparison to what we're seeing right now, right? So that's that's like setting the stage for where we are. Uh, in response, the Fed, you know, launches this new pro new program, the the Bank Term Funding Program, uh, BTFP, which allows uh, which you basically can offer up one year loans against um, you know eligible deposit or two el eligible good lord eligible deposit institutions against their treasuries. So. You explained this well yesterday, Austin, but like basically what are they doing uh, with the BTF program? Yeah, real simple, right? So if you owned uh, United States Treasuries, if you're a bank, a U.S. licensed bank or a foreign arm, an arm of a foreign bank that's licensed to operate within the United States and you own U.S. Treasuries, right? The safest investments supposedly, quote unquote, in the world, backed by the full faith and government of the United States. If you bought these and they're underwater, what the, what the Fed's doing is they're basically making up the difference in the form of a loan, right? So if you, if you have a 10 year treasury that is, you know, you paid a million bucks for with a 1.1 million payout on expiry, but it's only worth 650,000 on the market, then that 350,000 difference, they're going to loan you. They're going to give you the par value of that treasury to backstop it until it becomes due right? Until you can actually sell it for what it's worth. And so basically you took a risk 
and the, the risk didn't work out. And so here's your risk-free trade. And that's, that's essentially what they're doing to backstop these banks. And it's not just, it's not just Silicon Valley bank. It's, right. there's a lot of banks that are underwater like this. So, so 25 billion for exchange stabilization fund. Uh, that's an additional type of backstop that they don't think they're going to need on top of this BTFP program. But I think the key sentence is, is this, the BTFP will be an additional source of liquidity an additional source of liquidity. That is the point. Like when we talk about quantitative easing, we talk about money coming back into the market and like, you know, rates potentially slowing down when we're, when we're talking about the fed having additional sources of liquidity in market, that is a form of QE. That is when things start to actually get better. That is when, when Bitcoin and, and risk on assets uh, can start to move. So I think that's such an important point that we have to make about this program. Uh, and, and sort of how we got into the situation and why the markets have responded the way that they have, right? So so that's kind of like the sage set. I know we went over it really heavily yesterday, but I just really wanted to point out that like this is a form of QE. It's just not, you know, it's not the same as the traditional ways that we've seen it happen. I would say that this is fundamentally a different type of QE in that its effect is going to be different. Like this is not introducing additional liquidity. This is maintaining a level of liquidity. Right. So, I mean, it's maintaining no is, neutral liquidity is what yeah, it's like doing. No one, Which, no one is getting more money to throw around into investments. This is just <laughs> insurance. It's, yeah. it's a hell of a lot different than sucking liquidity share out of the market. It, yeah. Is it the is last, a form yeah. of quantitative easing. And I think you, you set the stage very nicely. So Silicon Valley Bank needed a backstop because they had more outflows than they could handle. So they were dumping their treasuries at a loss, which the government stepped in and said, hold on, you know, let's let's pause here real quick do you have more you want to say about svb before we move yeah, on to signature because so, so basically svb didn't, didn't just make a mistake they consciously sought and achieved higher yields for their depositors by making riskier choices than other banks so for for eight months svb didn't have a risk management division period so they were out doing things that made absolutely no sense i think for for any normal bank and it's, it's pretty you know pretty well spelled out here um but if you look at the, the chart you can actually see that they were buying long-term treasury yields, uh, which you know basically you know incurs this interest expense all the way into Q4 of 2022. So as mm -hmm. rates were going up, they were out buying long-term treasury bonds, knowing you know if you had a risk manager or anybody who understands you know understands what happens when rates go up uh, against treasuries that they're trying to buy, like they were out doing risky things. Um, so it's mm -hmm. of no surprise that that they're in this situation is the point, uh, and the data supports that fact. And so, the, you know, the fact that they had a two point eight billion dollar hole in their balance sheet, it doesn't come as a surprise. Like the data supports right. it. So that, that's a big difference than what we see on the signature side. Now, I think we can get into it. But I just wanted to okay. show you know, that their behavior was was not risk adverse. It was actually really, really risky. And it was it was, a, it was a very bad move. So I want to take you guys back to a time many, many moons ago, and it was December the 23rd or 24th of 1913. Do you guys know the significance of that date? So the uh, when the crash? crash? No, no wait. The, that's when, no, when no, that's was created. Cool. That's right. That was the day that the Federal Reserve was pushed through Congress. And you know why mm -hmm. it was pushed through Congress on that day? Because most, most congressmen were gone and they were able to push it through. Right. And so this feels very similar to me because what happened is Silicon Valley Bank went down. And you know how we found out about it? How we found out about Signature? Because they put it in the same press release that they, that they when they were talking about backstopping Silicon Valley Bank, right? And so here's basically the way that this worked. We got the press release. We're going to backstop Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, and by the way, New York regulators stepped in and closed down Signature Bank today, citing a systemic risk. Now, there's a lot of speculation around this um, and a lot of insiders from signature saying hey you know we had a big amount of outflows but we were covering them uh we were completely fine and i think now is probably the time to kick over to adam and then i will kick it over to you yeah. my friend um so let's talk about this tweet real quick from adam cochran and i think he sums it up very very nicely he says there doesn't seem to be much sign that signature was under duress when it was closed and there doesn't so why was it closed under FDIC procedures, which screw over investors and not a charter revoke that lets it liquidate? As an investor, I accept that if I make a risk investment and it goes to zero, that's on me. But if you seize a bank and it has assets in excess of liabilities, that's shareholder property. 
I didn't hold a ton of signature stock, but that would still make me eligible for legal action as a wronged party. Now, here's the important part. If regulators misused FDIC protocols and banking scares to simply cut off a crypto bank and screw over shareholders for the sake of Operation Choke Point, then you can bet your ass we're going to sue over that. Operation Choke Point has been pulling out all the stops against crypto, but that means they're likely to overreach, which they may have just done. If that's the case, then we as an industry will need to push back with everything we've got at any opening. If they want to make crypto illegal, then they can pass a damn bill in Congress to do so. If they want it regulated, they can give us regulatory frameworks. What they cannot do is abuse the law to squash us without making it illegal. At the end of the day, crypto in America can only really be settled by Congress, which is a legislative or the judiciary, judiciary branch. Regulators try and bully the industry without letting it get to that because they know they can't fight on a fair playing field. If this is a legal gap they've left, we'll damn well take it. And do you want to do you want to break down the uh, the Nick Carter tweet real quick, buddy? Yeah, just, well, I mean, if you've got it, you can grab it. <clears throat> I've got it. Go for so it. So Barney Frank, uh, you guys probably have heard of the Dodd Frank banking. I forget what the hell they call it, but anyhow, it was a it was a set of rules that were put in place for banking. One of those was uh, if it's you know if you're transacting over ten thousand dollars, it gets reported to the IRS. Things of that nature. So Barney Frank, uh, who helped draft the landmark Dodd-Frank Act after the 2008 financial crisis, said there was no real objective reason that Signature had to be seized. I think part of what happened was that regulators wanted to send a very strong anti-crypto message, Frank said. We became the poster boy because there was no insolvency based on the fundamentals. And Nick says, dear God, Barney Frank openly admits that Signature was arbitrarily shuttered despite no insolvency because regulators wanted to kill off the last major pro crypto bank. And that should piss you off. That pisses me off. Uh, I, I rolled and tossed and turned in bed last night with the level of anger this caused me. And to be perfectly frank, like it's not, this isn't a, a partisan thing, right? You know, this administration quite clearly hates crypto. But I got news for you. The last administration did too. Trump was no crypto fan. Like he he thought it was, you know, monkey money. So like, uh, but but the way that they're going after that, this, they are absolutely circumventing uh, the legal routes. So my question to you guys is, did they overstep? Have they pushed back so far and showed their hands so much that we're at the point to where legal action can be taken against this administration? Clay, I kick it to you. Corval. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I was just going <laughs> to say, I'd like to see these lawsuits manifest. Uh, that would be great to see. Um, I do think they definitely need to provide some clarity around what they meant by systemic risk because it seems like they were trying to frame it like Clay said that this was somehow related to Silicon Valley Bank. But from my cursory research, uh, not at all. Not at all. I have the, uh, I, I tweeted it out last night. The, um, I think it's called like the 10K or something like that, some form that civil, uh, Silicon Valley Bank neglected to, or no, Silvergate neglected to submit to the SEC um, early this month. Uh, Signature submitted theirs, and there's like a little blurb on crypto, and they're very clear that all they're doing is just holding cash for, you know, crypto affiliated businesses. They're not engaged in crypto at all. It's just, you know, I let you open up a bank account. And uh, so their exposure isn't that incredible either so it really doesn't make a lot of sense yeah so austin go down go down a little bit on what because i don't want to have to re-pull up with jordan we'll go up so right sure keep going all right nope yep that, that, boom that one read, read, one? read okay read that yeah read that because many are saying frank is an impartial some more evidence signature asset portfolio was nowhere near as troubled as svb sell side felt signature was sound yesterday FDIC itself was reportedly surprised by the decision Sunday night. And well, let's go ahead and kick over to this. So the closure of Signature Bank seems unwarranted as their HTM, what is that, hold to market yep. securities? Yep. 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 Unrealized losses aren't that big compared to its overall asset base. Some other factors likely at play here. Very, very right. interesting. So, so very, very interesting. Now, it's really hard to see this chart and so i'm just gonna i'm gonna do it for you but uh when we, you know, here the reason, I, 
the reason I brought up um, Silicon Valley Bank is because the 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 unrealized losses on uh, hold you know hold to maturity securities. This is them over here, Silicon, Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. You know, I, basically, as I you know as I stated, uh, you know, showing you basically that that graph, like you know, they were increasing. They were basically increasing. So uh, Silicon Valley Bank was increasing exposure to more mortgage-backed security interest risk. You know, as quantitative tightening was going on, so they were clearly that's why they found themselves in the situation. Over here is Signature. So I don't know. Can you see where my right? So we've got so between Silicon Valley Bank and Signature, we've got Citibank, PNC, J.P. Morgan, Huntington, Wells Fargo, First Republic, U.S.B. Truist, and Bank of America right. that have more massive uh drawdown and but what is the one difference the signature had that the rest of them didn't have and there's got to be at least 30 banks ahead of them in terms of unrealized losses um so uh what is they, the, had, they, mean, had, they, signet. they had crypto clients they had signet right they had the ability to move money from one account to the other 24 hours a day seven days a week instantly which caters to the crypto market yep and so this is going to continue to unfold this is not a, the end of the story by no. any stretch no, no no absolutely not so so let's let's like dig in a little bit to the signature thing because i was curious like what what you know what makes this possible is really what it came down to to me and obviously the information we got was so vague um that i wanted to go a few steps further and see you know what what was put out about this as to the reasoning and and you know why did the fdic you know as it became a shock to the fdic that signature needed to be closed what information was put out uh that, that sort of you know, allowed this to happen. So basically, the New York Consolidated Laws bank, Banking Law, so BNK 606 is sort of the justification uh, for, for how this goes down. And effectively, the superintendent may, in his discretion upon such conditions, any of the above, uh, uh, as, as approved by him, surrender possession and permit such banking organizations to resume business. Well, guess what? He can also make them, you know, not no longer be able to be in business and so if we look at all the the different reasons why this may be the case uh the ones that stood out to me are b c and d so is conducting its business in an unauthorized or unsafe manner uh is in an unsound or unsafe condition to transact its business and cannot with uh safety and uh expedity continue business like those are really the three to me that that stand out i think as you go into like further documentation um mm -hmm. And that's really, I think, the justification against crypto, right? Let's say if you if you had to break it down, you know, if they're gonna pen it on something, it's usually something along those lines, right? So, so in in court, those are the those are probably the ones they're gonna have to prove were untrue, right? right. It sounds like they're gonna have to come back and say your justification for closing us, the reasons you gave us were untrue, and here's why. Yeah. So so basically, in a joint a joint statement on crypto risk assets. So these are actual documents related to. Uh, why they shut down um, Signature, and it's from the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and and the uh, you know, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, so the OCC, and and dude, and there's a litany of reasons why. Wait, 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 Signature or Silvergate? Uh, that's a that's a January third, twenty twenty three. Dates didn't line up. Oh, so this is this is the Silvergate document. Whoops. Is this a Silvergate document? This seems like a just a general press release on maybe the general. Of crypto hey, yo, I got to go drive aspect. some liquid. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but effectively, you know, there's there's just so many reasons that you know they they would go down this road, and and really, it's like the the you know deposits placed by crypto assets related to the entity that are for the benefit, like basically like. They're making the case that the stability of deposits, deposits, um, you know, into banks like this may enter periods of stress or market vol volatility related to vo vulnerabilities in the crypto asset sector, uh, which may or may not be specific to crypto assets related entities. Such deposits can be susceptible to large rapid inflows or outflows uh, when end customers react and basically saying that um, they drive instability. Right. So like this mm -hmm. creates market contagion. Um, and this is, you know, these are the basis of which, you know, they're going to go after Signature Bank to say that, you know, things like Signet uh, shouldn't exist because it drives, you know, like the stuff that we saw with the DPEG of of uh, Coinbase and et cetera. You know, this is these are the reasons they're going to bring forth that that Signature should be shut down. And so, you know, I, like clearly there's an attack, you know, ongoing against yeah. 
against these these entities. And I mean, they do make a you know, it's a fair point, right? I mean, you have like the you have FTX, you have uh, you have Do Kwan, you've got all these collapses happening, and these rapid, massive volatility causing like massive inflows and outflows in crypto. It makes sense, but it seems like this is like kind of like a a backwards way to go about it. Maybe they should just provide, you know, proper regulation. <laughs> well, you know, we were told when this started. I mean, Ellie tweeted it out almost instantly saying, hey, there's going to be a bunch of Wells notices sent out over the next few uh, days here. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an operation to actively debank crypto companies. We heard about it and then we saw it. And now this is just the latest iteration. So like if if you guys thought this was a conspiracy theory before, it's not. It's not a conspiracy theory. And, you know, I was I was chatting with a buddy last night and he said, dude, we're going up against the most powerful people in the world. What did you think they were going to do? Just roll over and let it happen? Of course not. But at the end of the day, the good news is we have a Congress that is majority on the side for crypto. We have a very strong chance that the new administration coming in will be pro crypto because there's a large segment of this possibility that is, or excuse me, of this population that's pro crypto and votes are worth a lot these days. So I don't know. I don't know. But, but here's the good news Bitcoin doesn't give a shit. Bitcoin doesn't seem to care. And if you're in this for the long haul, let it all wiggle out, man. Let it all wiggle out and ride the wave. That's what I say. Yeah. I mean, Austin, I think like going back to to your your earlier statement. So these are the basis of which you know see joint statement on crypto risk of banking organizations. Like mm -hmm. this is this is the case that they're making against Signature, regardless if it came out on January twenty third, because this document was released on February or January third. This this was February twenty third, which was you know only two weeks ago or three you know three weeks ago. But mm -hmm. what kind of like is crazy is. You know, such such deposits can be susceptible to large and rapid inflows and outflows as, uh, when customers react to crypto asset sector related events, media reports and uncertainty. Uh, this this uncertainty results in deposit volatility, you know, yada, yada, yada. Right. So basically they're saying that the net inflows from from signatures from Silvergate's closing going to signature uh, is a you know, that that's a problem. So, like, so they're picking up so many new accounts and so such large net inflows that they could see equivalent outflows if there's anything that happens. And that's the justification for shutting now, them Now, they gave guidance recently. The Fed came out and gave guidance saying, use caution when dealing with crypto companies or cryptocurrency as a whole. Why did they not go to Signature and say, I need you guys to close Signet. It's a problem. And I need you guys not to take on crypto companies any longer. Now, I would guess that the former they could probably do, the latter they probably could not because it's a legal business in the United States. But my gut tells me they wanted to send a message. Yeah. Well, that these guys the, were the sacrificial lamb. That here's seems the to be the case. I mean, here's the message right here. It, it, it literally runs from, from this sentence to the end of this paragraph. Based on the agency's current understanding and experience to date, the agency believe that issuing or holding as principal crypto assets that are issued, stored, or transferred on open public and or decentralized networks or similar systems is highly likely to be inconsistent with safe and sound business practices. Further, the agency has significant safety and soundness concerns of the business models that are concentrated in crypto asset related activities or have concentrated exposure to the crypto asset sector. The agency will continue to closely monitor crypto asset related exposures of banking organizations. As warranted, the agencies will issue statements related to engagement by banking organizations in the crypto asset related activities. The agencies will continue to engage and collaborate with other relevant authorities as appropriate on issues arriving, uh, arising from activities involving crypto assets. So hmm. if it needs to be any more plainly spelled out, I think that paragraph pretty much does it. And so that is from the release of February 23rd. And I guarantee you that this, you know, these are all just building the case yeah. Uh, as you've seen, as to why Signature Bank need not exist. And then as we move forward, why any other bank that wants to, you know, basically fill in the gaps need not exist either. Because, because by the way, if it was just net inflows of, you know, of massive quantity, if that was really the problem, well, then how, you know, how is this any different? Just in bank giants, JP Morgan Chase and Citigroup are trying to handle, handle the largest movement of deposits in over a decade. Okay, well, let's go back and see. Uh, who was, uh, where was it? 
you know, who's who's much further up on this on this sort of risk chart than Signature Bank was. Uh, JP Morgan's right here. Uh, where's City is right in front of them. Yeah, City's right in front of them. So like, it, it's kind of speaking out of both sides of your mouth. Like like you, you can start to paint the picture uh, as to what we're seeing now. Can can JP Morgan Chase and Citigroup handle those deposits and an economic downturn? better of course they can they've got trillions trillions and trillions of dollars of aum and so you know so i think that the, their risk profile is small uh compared to that of silvergate or signature but the case still remains that you know basically this paragraph starting here to here uh is it, it is the attack it is what we can expect so basically yeah. un unrelated regulatory actions but that were packaged to make them seem like they were the same um because the signature bank thing is here. It seems like their reasoning is the very last sentence in that paragraph that you read. They just yeah. have a concentrated exposure to. Right. The because they didn't hold country. any assets. So yeah, it, it's they didn't just... hold any crypto. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. I mean, it basically says anyone who, who plans to engage with crypto companies, like we will be actively monitoring and or going after them from this point forward. And so that puts us in a very, very precarious situation as an industry where in my opinion, I put a tweet out yesterday saying the sad part about this situation is like, A, it's going to affect U.S. exchanges. B, it's going to affect any type of DeFi innovation in the United States. If you're a developer here, I'd be considering moving somewhere else because why would you want to be here? Uh, and C, it affects fiat on and off ramps for all of us. And, and you have to find a workaround to that. And if we can't work in the general confines of the U.S. banking system, then we have huge problems. And so that's what we're seeing here. And so... Um, there's a massive case to be made to Adam's point that, you know, financially they were not in a bad, you know, in a, in a dire straight situation, um, that this is a targeted event. And I think that, you know, if you read between the lines that the documents point to that exact, um, you know, outcome. And this did not go through, you know, to Mace Papa's point, you said legislative overreach. This is not legislation. There's yeah. no legislation involved here. There has been none. And so my hope is, you know, to Adam's tweet that it does move into the courts and we have to start, you know, exposing what's going on under the hood because discovery generally will bring all of this to the, to the forefront. So, yep. I, <sighs> so I, I, exhausting. I, yeah. It's exhausting. I mean, but, but there's like, there's enough there that like, like, I'm sorry, let, let's go back. Like if there's smoke, there's probably fire. Like that, this is the kind of situation that if you start to read between the lines, and and add up all the pieces you know it it, I, it just can't come as a surprise to anyone that like operation choke point 2.0 2.0 as kraken referenced in the tweet yesterday is a very real thing um and so uh i don't know if you, if you saw ellie's tweet from yesterday but uh the sec and, and gensler put out um sort of their their proposal for for their con, you know congressional budget of fiscal year 2024 asking for uh you know, $2.4 billion up from 2.1 last year um, in 2023. And the cited reason is, is very heavily about crypto. Over the last five years, we've seen substantial increase uh, in the crypto markets where investors are putting their hard-earned assets at risk in a highly speculative asset class. Today, investors in these markets lack fundamental disclosure about crypto assets themselves and the, and the firms who execute their trades and custody uh, their assets. While we work to ensure that uh, issuers, intermediaries, and tokens properly come into compliance. We will not hesitate to use every tool in our toolbox to root out non-compliance, such, such as through investigation and enforcement actions. So, I don't know. What, what do you think? What are your reactions like, to that? I think I need a drink. I don't even drink. <laughs> but that's what that's what comes to mind. I, you know what? It's I'm not surprised by any of this. It's all, it's all along the same lines man and you know what a few weeks from now i hope we have a lot nicer things to say about this i hope because we do have some very big allies in the government we have very big allies in this industry we have very big civil uh civilian allies right civilian organizations such as the the digital chamber of commerce like we have a lot of very smart organizations that are out there lobbying for this industry so um you know best advice i can take myself is just pause take a deep breath Enjoy the run. Bitcoin doesn't seem to care. And if we stay above 25.5 and we hold that, hang on, baby, because it's go time. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. I, 
Sorry, go ahead, Corval. No, I was just agreeing, dude. I love that sentiment. Just hold on. We're gonna if we break it, we're gonna go to the moon, baby. <laughs> El, El Luna. La Luna. La Luna I, mean, I, I go back to this as well, which is, you know, what, because, you know, I, I was like having a moment the other day. I think it was like after the USDC DPEG and, and all of this, you know, they, they shut down Signature Bank and, and all these things. You know, saying to myself, you know, what are we going to do? Like, this is, this is actually really, really concerning. Like, you know, the, the people in power and, and the weapons of which they wield are, are far greater than anything that I can do on this podcast or on the show or on Twitter or, you know, anything that, I, you know, just they're beyond my reach. Right. And so, you know, I go back to things like crypto four, three, five from Coinbase and, and, you know, someone tweeted at me asking, well, what, what can we do? Like, what are we supposed to do? And I think that the, the best advice that I can give and is, is enlisting in things like crypto four, three, five, like actually, getting involved to try to you know to try to at least be in the ear uh of of your congress men and women who you know hopefully can help prompt change and so you know I, I go back to this and i and i filled it out myself and and you know i was a little taken aback by the amount of information that you need to provide uh to them but it's worth it like at the bottom line is like if they're going to shut down crypto or if they're going to come after you for taxes they're going to do whatever you know might happen next or could happen they're going to have that information anyway and so I would, you know, I would really encourage people to go out uh, and 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 join something like Crypto Four Three Five and be part of taking action uh, to try to save this space because everybody, you know, even the little, you know, even the little person is needed in this scenario. And so um, that's that for me is is something that you know I want to try to take seriously because that that's the kind of stuff we can actually do. So let's end the episode with some hopium. I have a little hopium for you, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly two hours and 21 minutes ago, $1 billion of Tether on the Tron chain and $1 billion of Tether on Ethereum was minted. Two billion fresh Tethers just came to market about two hours and 15 minutes ago. So we all know what that means when that what, happens. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, that's that's fresh money coming into the market. That is fiat into the crypto market, ladies and gentlemen. And generally, these proceed el pumpa so Press that's paper. it that's it let's get the hell out of here my name's austin with block bites with me as always crypto clay cheech marin just kidding that's horrible <laughs> it's not really cheech and we're gonna get the hell out of here mikey take us home buddy <laughs>